Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War Frontline Update for the 17th of August 2023. I'm mixing it up today just to keep you on your toes. Producing a Frontline one first. I was supposed to do it last night, but it got a bit too late. This is the last night of my holiday. Uh, so over the next couple of days, I might... Uh, well, you might see my ugly mug back in the corner of the videos in two days' time. And if that's not something to look forward to, I don't know what is. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll go to the northeast sector, the Kupiansk here, to Svatova, to Krimina front line. And uh, I actually reported these uh, gains yesterday, but I, I just kept it there. JR's helped me with the mapping. Thank you so much. Oh, and that reminds me, if you want to find out what the lines mean on my map, please pause the video and check out the map legend. Okay, so going to Kupiansk, we have um, uh, Russian forces basically attacking in a number of places, Ukrainian forces attacking in a number of places, a lot of repelled activity. I, I told you about this small area by Kupiansk that the Russians have gained according to Syriac maps there. And we have uh, a little bit of movement down here, although Andrew Perpetua, like I said yesterday, it was actually rejigging of the map and you could tell by what how he had labelled it. And that's what he said in his live stream. So this isn't actually uh, an attacking movement, although some slight gains is according to Suryat maps in the area. Uh, no report says in the Kupiansk direction, Commander Sirsky ha has said, due to the complication of the situation in the Kupiansk direction, most of the day I worked in the units that lead the defence on the approaches to the city. So this is around, as I say, Kupiansk. The enemy is trying to break through the defences of our troops every day in different directions with assault squads consisting mainly of prisoners. With the aim of blocking and later capturing Kupiansk, a number of important decisions were made. Kind of a bit vague. I, I have heard from an... Uh, there was another source uh, I was going to share with you yesterday, but it's slightly out of date now. But it basically talking about how uh, the Ukrainian, uh, it's pro-Ukrainian source saying that their defence is kind of better than the the, the Russian Storm Z uh, penal troops, uh, those squads of uh, convict fighters that they're using uh, a lot in this area. Having said that, you know, there is also talk that in this northeastern axis, the Ukrainian, the Russians do have fairly decent force concentration and uh, quality compared to elsewhere. I mean, they've had troops up and around here for some time, as well as bringing uh, others to the front too. Actually, uh, before we go down to Bakhmut, I just want to give you a little bit of analysis of the front from Mike Martin here, who's uh, really worth uh, listening to when he does speak. He was great on Ukraine Latest. He's a um, former army officer and author and a senior visiting fellow for war studies. Right. Uh, so here is the last thread, which is a roundup of the counteroffensive. I prefer offensive as the Ukrainians have the momentum at the moment. He does refer to a number of his other uh, threads as well. But I just want to go through this. So what is the Ukrainian strategy? It's actually very simple. And indeed, what he's going to say is exactly what I've been saying for some time, but might as well go through this. All of those blue arrows are axes of Ukrainian assaults. The aim is to keep the Russians spread thin and unable to reinforce. And it's working. The Russians appear to have run out of reserve and are now moving units around between different parts of the front line. This is, a, and he accentuates this in capitals and asterisks, very bad news for them. The second thing about this strategy is it means the Ukrainians can remain balanced between the various axes and it can choose which one it wants to advance on when it becomes obvious which one is advantageous. The key axes being the two middle ones running south towards the Sea of Azov. So it's these ones, obviously, the ones we've been concentrating on coming down from Veliko Novosilka and coming down coming down from Orokiv, Malatok, Machka, kind of area. So the Uruzhaini area at the moment and the Robotna area at the moment. Uh, as we know, this enables the Ukrainians to cut the Russian forces into a major strategic victory. The other fronts are very useful as they keep the Russians pinned down. In Bakhmut, for instance, the Russians are never going to pull out of Bakhmut after they lost tens of thousands of soldiers there and told everyone it was utterly vital. Um, and as Mike Martin then pipes in, Bakhmut was not vital. Uh, and now, over the last week, the Ukrainians have established another bridgehead over the river Dnipro in Kherson. Uh, and this is that double-tailed arrow 
there. So now there are two bridgeheads opposite Kherson, near Oleshki and near Kozachi Lahiri. Now, these bridgeheads are important for the obvious reasons. Uh, they give the Russians more to think about and give the Ukrainians more options. But they also told us something about the Russians. The Russians are losing the ability to do counter battery fire against the Ukrainians. Now, uh, back to me, this is something I've been reporting consistently uh, for weeks and weeks, that the attrition of the Russian artillery systems is leaving them unable to do effective counter-battery fire, and lots and lots of Russian sources are telling us exactly this. Uh, so back to Mike Martin, basically the first bridgehead was established, uh, It came when it was established, it came under sustained Russian artillery fire. Gradually, the Ukrainians have destroyed that artillery and Russian artillery right along the front. Russian artillery has been destroyed at twice the rate over the last couple of months. The Russians are finding it very hard to provide effective artillery fire, which coupled with the lack of reserves is not a good look. This is what the Ukrainians have been aiming for and makes me think that things are going to start moving again in the next month or so. For me, though, another key front has opened up. For ages, I've been warning about the Sahel. This is totally off everyone's radar, but actually represents an equal strategic threat to Europe. Niger was just the latest in a long series of developments in the region. I'll try to pull together a thread uh, on Sahel in the next few days. So that is, uh, and he, you know, he's an author. You can buy his books and and see what he's all about. But uh, basically, exactly what I've been saying that the Ukrainians are kind of controlling to a degree the front line uh, by fixing Russians in place. And even when the Russians do these distracting attacks, say up in the Kupiansk and Svatova sectors, actually if the Ukrainians can only use their kind of home guard or non-counteroffensive troops and resources to defend there, then essentially the Ukrainians will... Well, the Russians are self-fixing. So the Ukrainians are able to manage these attacks uh, without expending excess resources, while the Russians are expending resources that could be better used elsewhere. So it's in fact a kind of, you could argue the Russians are shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, they might gain some land here, uh, but it's not strategically massively important. If they get too close to Kupiansk, that might be a worry. But essentially, they are fixing their own troops in in places that that is not really useful for them because it, they are they are failing to properly fix Ukrainian troops or at least the troops that they would otherwise use on the front lines elsewhere. So that is that analysis, and I and I think that's a pretty decent one. If we come to Klish Chivka and um, what's going on uh, down south of Bakhmut, uh, is an interesting one because there's not a lot of. Uh, uh, it, you know, well, there's no information really coming out there from pro-Ukrainian sources. And that does make me wonder whether the Russians do have a bit of an upper hand uh, in the ebbs and flow of, of the war. So we heard from we heard from Syriac maps represented with the red line here that they had taken back Klyshivka. In fact, Syriac maps had never shown any loss of control of the Russians in Klyshivka. Uh, and they're showing a little bit of gain back in the... Kodiumivka era, maybe. Um, but this this talk from some pro-Russian sources that Klyshchivka is being taken back by the Russians, it's such an odd thing for them to do, to go into that, that settlement that sits below uh, a kind of bluff, below a hill to the west. And it just is like shooting fish in a barrel. I don't know why they want to take that, uh, that settlement. Um, nonetheless, the Russians are claiming that, and it, and because the Ukrainians are not making any claims about what's happening here, it does make me wonder whether the Russians have had some success here over the last few days. Um, what the ISW reports is the Ukrainian forces continued offensive operations near Bakhmut on August the 16th, but did not make any confirmed advances. Uh, and a Russian mill blogger claimed that fighting in the Bakhmut area was significantly less intense on August the 16th than it had been in recent months. So we were seeing the quietest period at the moment in Bakhmut, and that's kind of reflected by not a lot of news coming out. But Russian forces continue ground attacks near Bakhmut and reportedly advanced. So while the Ukrainians haven't themselves reported any advance and there's no confirmation of any Ukrainian advances, for the ISW Institute for the Study of War, American military, military think tank, they report that the Russian sources do claim 
advances in the Bakhmut area. A Russian news aggregator claimed on the 15th, so two days ago, that Russian forces attacked near Vesele, and we had that. We talked about how that they had made gains, and that was confirmed by Andrew Perpetua's mapping uh, there. Um, and counterattack south of Klyschivka on the evening of August the 15th. So then two days ago, south of Klyschivka, uh, there was this counterattack from Andrivka. The Russians did lose a lot of equipment in uh, those attacks uh, th in that area. Russian sources claimed on August the 16th that Russian forces counterattacked near Klyschivka on the 15th and 16th and have reportedly established complete control over the settlement. Another Russian mill blogger claimed that Russian forces also advanced near Yahidny, which is an area that the Ukrainians have been uh, somewhat successful in over the past couple of weeks uh, in taking incremental gains there. So uh, really the conclusion is I don't really know what's going on around Bakhmut. There's nothing solid. Uh, Andrew Perpetua hasn't changed any lines around Klyschivka himself, um, but it'll be interesting to see whether there are indeed some successes for the Russians there or whether they are just talking up uh, potentials, which is something that they so often do. Right, okay, moving on down south past Avdivka, there are there's nothing really to report here. The Ukrainian forces can reportedly continue ground attacks, uh, but did not make any claimed or confirmed advances, and that's exactly the same uh, wording for the Russians as well. So no one has actually claimed any advances, and there are none confirmed in that area. So we can move on down past, indeed, Vukhledar towards uh, Veliko Novosilka. We have a few, uh, well, a, a, a little change in the mapping here by uh, um, Suryat Maps, a pro-Russian mapper, to show that uh, in line with what Andrew Perpetua said maybe, what, three, four days ago, that this little um, area of, of land that's holding out for the Russians, because it's got this ravine running uh, west to east here, uh, that is heavily mined as well, and uh, there's only kind of one way here. Well, there's you can get in from the side on both sides, but that would require control, solid control of over Priyutny. So the the Ukrainians have been finding more success going down the flanks of the river here, uh, the Mokryali River, um, that meanders its way down through these settlements. Uh, and they have chipped away a little bit at the sides. But I, my guess is that once Zavitne, Bezhenya and Priyutne fall, then, you know, then they'll worry about this or, or just naturally the Russians will vacate that area. So there it has been success here, obviously. Urizhani has definitely been liberated and the Ukrainians are moving further to south. Let's look at some of the claims around here. The, this is War Mapper's map. I like War Mapper's maps. They are colourful. They aren't always the most current. Uh, so the, here is a claim in the uh, Velikanova Silka sector that, yep, Staromorsk and Orozhani have been liberated and that they are working towards the south. It also claims that the Ukrainians are having some success just, I think, to the south of Novodonetsk, and that's leaving that very perilous for the Russians uh, to remain there. Um, so that is that is something that's coming out at the moment. We have Suryat Maps saying, situation southwest of Donetsk, recent video footage from the 35th Separate Brigade of the Marines of the Ukrainian Army has announced that the town of Urizhani is completely under Ukrainian control. During the last days, combing operations were made in the remaining parts of the town from where the Russian army retreated. And this is taking the Russian army back to Zavitne, Bajania. We see on that corner, we've seen cluster munitions take out the Russians as they retreated from Urizhani. That was now a couple of days ago. Um, here, so slightly more uh, recent reporting, heavy fighting is reported just north of Zavitne, Bajania. Uh, and it's, it's going to be about crossing that river. So we go to look on my map. The front line, most of both mappers agree that the front line uh, it follows the river for the most part uh, down uh, and around to the north of uh, Zavitne Bajiania. Uh, of course, if the Ukrainians can get across this river, so this represents an area, as according to Syriac maps, where the Russians don't have full control, then you might see the Ukrainians come down this side of the river uh, into Zavitne, whilst also you know attempting to come from uh, down here and the road 
I don't know whether the Russians will have tried to take out that little bridge there um, to stop the Ukrainians from advancing. I would have thought so, uh, but we shall see. Um, and then no report says Vostok Battalion, so this is a Russian source, responsible for a big part of the defense of Virginia, now reports that the Ukrainians are heading east towards Kamenchik, raising concerns about possible defense. And this, so it says, uh, some under heat continues, having penetrated our defenses and felt all the delights of, of a fire bag, the enemy decided to expand the bridgehead uh, and today turned east, heading for the Otkadbyrsky settlement. Uh, I presume that's Kamenchik. About seven units of armoured vehicles accompanied by infantry and trying to find new promising direction. The inconvenience is that the new configuration of the front line gives the enemy the opportunity not to attack Novodonetsky um, in the forehead, striking at Oktyabr, that place at the same time, so Kamenchik, uh, solving this problem. Well, once again, we repeat, the battle plan will show. Uh, in other words, just to the... Uh, west here, uh, east here, we have Kamenchik, and the Ukrainians uh, appear to be pushing down or across to Kamenchik to interdict this road that apparently they might have already done previously or they're attempting to do previously. But if they take Kamenchik, then Novodonetsky is kind of left on its own, uh, and you would see that, you know, you'd see the Russians leave there pretty promptly, I would have thought. So it looks like the Ukrainians are, are going further to the south uh, or the south. East, uh, as according to Vostok. Right, uh, this uh, Getty source says here, the south of Urijani village and the southern approaches are completely cleared and controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine. Aerial reconnaissance and artillery of the armed forces of Ukraine are actively working on the village of Zavitny, which we can uh, fully imagine uh, would be the case. Uh, Zavitny Bazanya. Uh, and fortified areas west of the village of Staromoyolsky in the direction of the Grishevaya Gully. So this is this gully, I think, coming down there that represents the front line, or at least the Russian defensive line. Um, from the field, they report heavy artillery strikes of the armed forces of Ukraine on the village of Novodonetsky and Novomayorsky. So yes, they're attacking Kamenchik, uh, but they're also heavily bombarding Novodonetsky and Novomayorsky. So we're seeing multiple activity along the front. And there's actually even talk about opening up the front at Drozdnyanka as well, possibly. And this is a case of keeping the Russians uh, spread really thinly and possibly unable to whack all the moles as they pop their heads up. Um, so back to Urijani sort of area. Interestingly, for this attack, uh, Ukrainians are bypassing Novodonetsky to attack Kriminchik. If successful, the Russians in Novodonetsk are trapped. So that's going back to what I said previously. And then the spokesperson of the general staff, Andriy Kovalev, has just said Ukrainian troops were successful further to the south from the recently liberated settlement of Urijani. So they're already saying that Ukrainian troops are being successful in the south. And that will mean that Zavitny Bajenia is in a bit of trouble. So good success, it appears, for the Ukrainians around the Velikanova Silka salient. Uh, but it's all about Staromelnivka. As I keep saying, this is where the um, the trenches really start. Indeed, if we go back to uh, the war map and map, just wondering if they've got the trenches. Yeah, you can see them just here. I wonder if the... the um, zoomed out map might help us a little bit. So uh, in that area of Staromolnivka, uh, so we've got Urijani up there, so we've got an, a trench line. It's not very clear to see, but it's basically the first line of trenches there, very close to where they are. But the main ones are here. Uh, actually, no, that could be the main ones I'm talking about. Uh, There's just a few other dot dotted ones up uh, so if we, there are a few other dotted ones maybe up around here, but the main trench line is sort of around here. And then once you get past that, it's just the one trench line, and then it's a it's a hop, skip, and a jump to um, to Mariupol is the theory. I mean, you can see there's just a big gap of defense is not being built. Now there might be some reason for that. There might be geographical features to take into account, but you can see why this is one of the main areas they would want to attack rather than going through all of these lines of defence to try and get around the corner to Melitopol.
Right. Anyway, moving on now. I uh, don't know that there's anything in... Oops. Um, Uh, sorry about that. Bit of a random bit of IT issue there. Anyway, uh, we have uh, not much more to report from the ISW. So we're going to go on to uh, Robotna area to the west here. But just bear in mind that there are some rumours that there's activity around uh, Drozhnyanka, which could res uh, represent a a bit of um, a an extra front front opening up for the Ukrainians. My laptop is going absolutely insane. Sorry about this. Um, I have some serious mouse issues. Um, anyway, uh, moving on to the West, we can see that there is a lot happening uh, around Robotna, and that's pretty significant. So let's look at and see what the, uh, the sources say. Uh, just bear in mind that the, all these different colored pins refer well the darker ones refer to Syriac maps and the lighter ones refer to Andrew Perpetua. So both are admitting there are quite significant gains around uh, this area. There's some slight rejigging of Russian gains to the east of Robotna. Um, so if we if we look at Robotna as a town, according to um, oops, dearie, dearie me, I'm gonna have to sort my mouse out. Sorry about this. Sorry, so we can see that the Ukrainians, as according to Andrew Perpetua, have pushed the Russians back to the very south of Robotna uh, and that they are having some success uh, further to the east, although there might be some rejigs for the uh, in favour of the Russians up towards Nova Pokrovka, as Andrew Perpetua says these are uh, gains actually that went back to the ninth, so some time ago, but just rejigging, finding out the kind of shelling um, satellite imagery now. But in general, the Ukrainians are doing very well here and doing well certainly to the west towards Kapani. Right, let's look at some of the sources. Uh, War Mapper has the maps, as I say, that are very nice and clear, but they also might not be the most current maps for the area. Suryat Maps says situation on the Zaporizhia front during the last three days Ukrainian army made notable progress at Robotna axis in which troops took control over the neighboring forests and are fighting for the first houses of the town the recent video footage shows the Russian army targeting Ukrainian troops in the area which confirms the advances uh, are reaching ever more southerly positions as well as the increased use of material and human resources this is the acceptance that the Ukrainians really are uh, making some serious advantage, uh, advances and are moving further to the south. Um, strikers taken into battle near Robotna uh, uh, while the situation is described as severe by Russian channels. So the Russian channels are saying we are now seeing vehicles that we haven't previously seen. So it's starting to look a little bit more like some of the larger counteroffensive forces might be being brought to bear. Um, Ukrainian army shelling Russian positions in the village of Above. So that is uh, quite significant. They appear to, the Ukrainians appear to be uh, focusing on Vabove as a kind of next step uh, as they're taking on Robotna. Also considering Vabove moving down this um, trench line that comes down into Vabove. I wonder if War Mapper shows that. It does here. Um, so we have. Uh, the trench lines that the, that the Ukrainians have taken and then these other ones coming down into Vobovia and they're kind of trying to work their way down them. But remember, there are also secondary uh, and tertiary defences as well behind Novopokropivka and indeed behind uh, Vobovia. So that is uh, what's taking place. Uh, P-Star 1-1 says Russia is moving uh, on the first line, the 7th VDV, so airborne, and the 810th Naval Infantry Brigades. These are your elite troops, your paratroopers, and your Marines in order to contain the Ukrainian advances near Robotna. Ukrainians are trying to target those troops with artillery at the moment as they move from near Tokmak and Kopane. Uh, so these aren't, uh, I guess, like reserve reserves. These are pretty close. They're being moved from Kopane uh, and some apparently from Tokmak nearby, uh, the Russians, as many sources are saying, just are lacking reserves uh, to be able to robustly defend 
the area, well, at least they can at the moment just about, but by using elite troops, it's like what happens next uh, and whether this will show that they've actually got nothing left in the locker. Uh, this was, so we go back to the Institute for the Study of War, American military think tank again, says geolocated footage published on August the 16th, so that's yesterday, indicates the Ukrainian forces advanced northeast of Robotna and have likely made wider gains in the surrounding areas, given prior consistent Ukrainian activity in forested areas northeast of of the settlement and this is um, a claim that a Ukrainian tank has been hit with uh, a drone a K drone in the area which means a Ukrainian tank is operating here which means the, the Russian the Ukrainians are possibly in control of this area or, or certainly you know there or thereabouts and that would make a lot of sense so that is northeast of Robotna in this forested area uh, that is not under Russian control anymore, as according to both mappers. So that evidence fits uh, very much in with what, what we understand the situation to be. And that's from the ISW. Uh, and then this morning's sources are saying, War Gonzo, so this is a pro-Russian source, saying the Ukrainians have made progress in the grey zone near Robotna and Vobova, confirming additional presence we saw earlier in other Russian footage. And the Ukrainians did recon in force near Drozhnyanka. So that's a claim uh, from War Gonzo that, that opening up another possible axis of attack. And that would be uh, pretty worrying for the Russians if that was the case. So I don't know if you can see really much from this image as, as to understanding where the lines are but you can see according to Wolgonzo that Vobove here the Russian defensive line is right on the edge and it goes through the middle of Robotna uh, in a pretty much diagonal line so according to uh, Wolgonzo you have a line that looks I, I would guess let's see if I can do something here uh, the Russian defensive line let's put that in red uh, would look something like uh, this. Hey, welcome technology. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, so it goes somewhere like that, or maybe like that. Uh, and that the the Ukrainians appear to be uh, very close to Vobove as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult trying to make out the reality of the the war the front lines when you've got so many sources uh and so much information flying around or sometimes not enough okay ukraine is intensifying its counter offensive um bringing into battle one of the large units that we that were in reserve the 82nd brigade of the dshv according this is according to forbes so the number of the brigade is 2,000 soldiers. It's armed with Marder and Striker. So we are starting to see Striker armored personnel carriers and uh, infantry fighting vehicles, as well as Challenger 2 tanks. The brigade entered the battle on the Melotopol direction. Quote, the buildup of airborne troops around Robotnik can lead to quick successes of the Kiev forces, uh, the Forbes journalist predict. Uh, tonight, some Ukrainian so soldiers reported that the Russian occupying forces were knocked out by the armed forces of the Soviet Union, uh, by the armed forces of the yeah <laughs> of the Russians from the village of Robotny, the Ukrainian general staff has not yet confirmed this information. Uh, that doesn't no that, that's really confused me. Right tonight, some Ukrainian soldiers reported that the Russian occupied forces were knocked out by the Ukrainian armed forces from the village of Robotna uh, is, is what, what's supposed to be, yeah, as someone says here, the armed forces of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think that's a, a Freudian slip or not uh, the opposite there. So anyway, it's looking fairly good around this area for the Ukrainians with the knowledge that this has been a difficult sector for them. They have lost a lot of troops. They've lost a lot of vehicles, but it's that kind of attritional uh, grinding where you need to get to, uh, I guess, to a tipping point, and that tipping point has been reached. They reached, they've breached the first line of defence. They are over the worst of the minefields, uh, and it depends, you know, what awaits them between layers two and three of these defences. But taking Robotna and Vobove would be super, super important. Now, Weeb Union, who's another ostensibly pro-Russian uh, mapper on YouTube. Uh, reckons that basically all the Ukrainian uh, counter-offensive brigades have been brought to bear. Uh, after analysing 
Ukraine's composition of forces and more specifically the ones they have available and the ones they don't, uh, the reserve forces and the engaged forces, I can conclude Ukraine, I mean, you could do with a bit of punctuation, I can conclude Ukraine has already fully committed their forces to the battle. Uh, they only have two mechanised brigades in reserve, which would be the ones containing Challenger 2s and Abrams tanks. This means Ukraine has already started their main push a while back, like I claimed. They are waiting to catch a Robotna before they actually start their very last and final push uh, or battle of the offensive by engaging the final two mechanised brigades. Uh, not wholly sure that's correct. I'd say they've probably got quite a few, uh, quite a bit more to throw at uh, the front line, uh, and I don't think it's their final push here. Um, but they are starting to uh, to use other elements that 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 we haven't previously seen. But there, there's a, there's still an awful lot of Bradleys, a lot of strikers, a lot of other bits of kit that we just haven't seen. Uh, yet that is still going to be able to be used. So I think he's he's that's very charitable to the Russians, really, and a kind of negative outlook for the Ukrainians. I think the Ukrainians have had trouble here, um, but they they've got a lot left in the tank, and it, it's the Russians that really don't. I mean, it'd be it'd be rather interesting for him to say to actually do this analysis, but for the Russians. So what have the Russians brought to bear, and how much do they have left? Uh, and and are they looking at, uh, at their final kind of defensive push, you know, or the final ability to defend? You know, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's well, take that for what it is. I'll let you uh, evaluate those claims. Right, we're going to move on to the neat pro. Uh, bearing in mind that normally we go to Pieti Kaki, and there doesn't to be anything happening around there of note at the moment. It seems rather positional. Uh, Surya Maps has a has some Russian gains here back at Kazachi Lahiri. So they, and it's tr trying to work out sometimes whether um, Suryat Maps is just parroting the MOD, the Russian MOD, and just like goes with it. But of course, sometimes that is correct. I don't know that this is correct, but hey, it might be. Situation in Kherson front during the last hours, the Russian army managed to eliminate the Ukrainian salient west of Kazachi Lahiri. So this was supposedly a robust salient that the Ukrainians were using to attack in two directions. And then suddenly the Russians have uh, eliminated those troops and the salient. Uh, and they're doing that with a complete lack of troops that they're supposed to have in this area. On the other hand, P-Star 1-1 here says Kazachi Lahiri, uh, according to Russian sources, so these are Russian sources, there are not enough resources to counterattack the Ukrainian bridgehead. That's interesting because Surax Maps has just told me that they've completely eliminated the Ukrainians there. Uh, Russians are just trying to contain it due to a lack of troops. Not enough artillery, no surprise here. The Ukrainians have been successful at targeting ammo depots in Oleshki and in nearby settlements. Um, so this is a Russian... Uh, a Google Translate of a Russian source. For 10 days, the enemy has been holding a bridgehead in uh, Kazachi Lahiri, uh, five to seven kilometers. All that the command has undertaken is to strengthen the blocking of the area of possible expansion. The 108th left, and with it, the possibility of liquidating the bridgehead. We wait. Our artillery is not enough. So we they don't have the possibility of liquidating the bridgehead, is the Russian claim. And this Russian claim is they have eliminated the bridgehead. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, we'll go to the ISW Institute for the Study of War again to see what's going on in the Kherson uh, front as far as they are concerned. Russian sources claimed on August 15th, so two days ago, that Russian forces pushed Ukrainian forces from limited positions on the East Bank of Kherson Oblast. A prominent Russian mill blogger claimed on August 15th that Russian forces successfully counterattacked Ukrainian forces that established positions west of Kazachi Lahiri on the 14th, and that Ukrainian forces are no longer present in the area. Footnote 69, uh, let's go and see who that was. Uh, 69 is Rebar, uh, so that's a telegram post from Rebar. Take that, make of that what you will. Um, Russian sources claim that Russian forces have completely... Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, another... Another mail blogger claimed on August 15th that Russian forces pushed Ukrainian forces out of positions near Kazachi Lahiri as early as August the 12th. Actually, so let's go and check that out. Sorry, I was just uh, getting confused as to where I got to there. So that is from Rusish Army. So that is uh, another ultra nationalist mail blogger claiming real success 
five days ago for the Russians in pushing the Ukrainians out. Russian sources claim that Russian forces have completely cleared the left bank uh, of Ukrainian forces and the Russian Dnipro grouping of forces spokesperson, uh, Roman Kodryan, claimed that Russian forces destroyed the Ukrainian group maneuvering on boats in the Dnipro River Delta yesterday. So uh, there are all these claims from the Russians that they are having uh, plentiful success there. Yeah, basically rebar, um, and Rusic uh, and uh, uh, and another one or two. So uh, yeah, I don't know that that is actually what's happening. Um, we'll see whether the Russians have had any counterattacking success there. Um, I'm, I've not seen that from any Ukrainian sources, pro-Ukrainian sources. So um, yeah, we, we'll we'll wait to see what other information comes out from. Uh, from this area and that's all i have for the frontline update i'm going to get on with my news pieces now hopefully that was of use uh please like subscribe and share thank you so much for your support Toodle pips and i'll speak to you soon